right. Sure, we're ready. All right, we're recording. We're going ambient. So anything we say around here is going to be on microphone. So that's awesome. Yes, you and the green jacket. Explain IoT to me in your own words. Well, IoT is many things. Um, it can be both physical and philosophical. Um, metaphysical, actually. If you think of it, IoT and string theory. There's actually many different dimensions of Internet of Things devices. Is that what you want to We're editing this, right? You do this in post. You fix this in post, right? That in my hair. We're good. I'm not editing anything. <laughs> Sounds like my podcast. house. Are we ready? Yeah, we're going. So, I'm Bill Gardner, and I'm from Marshall University. Um, nothing I say here today represents Marshall University as faculty, um, students, uh, groundskeepers, or anyone. So, um, but I'm also, the, luckily, the co founder of HackerCon, Secure WD. This is year eight, and we really thank everyone for coming. And Adrian, this is your eight. eight I've been to every one of them, yes. Yeah. So today I'm going to talk about Internet of Things, the, sort of the promise as well as some of the scary stuff. Um, so with me, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Like I said, I'm Bill Gardner, and I'm from the Internet, and this is... Yeah, I'm Jamie Cope. I'm the Deputy Director at RCBI, Robert C. Bird Institute. I'm, uh, I'm pretty terrified to be here. Um, came to my first HackerCon last year. and You won a panel last year. I was, yeah. but no, you know, the panel's fine, but but the stuff that I learned here is just terrifying. I, I, I enjoy my bubble of not knowing about all the attacks from Russia and all that stuff. So. Um, but uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm the deputy director at RCDI. Like I said, we do uh, a lot of different things. We'll probably get into that later, I guess. Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Jeremy Mio. I'm the Information Security Officer at the local government. Uh, we're in the top 30 in the nation. Uh, I've spoke uh, last year at HackerCon, Secure WP, uh, and I've been invited onto this panel as a uh, last minute uh, guest. You don't, have to, you don't have to tell them that. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll let Bill start it all off. So, the Internet of Things. Uh, it's, it's a really hot buzzword. It's almost as Buzzwords word is cyber and cyber kill chain, right? So we talk about these things, what does it really mean? So we're hooking things to the internet that probably should never have been hooked to the internet. This includes toasters, um, uh, refrigerators, stoves. And the question is, is where's the promise and where's the benefit as opposed to why are we putting things on the internet that shouldn't be there in the first place and can't be secured? It's not like it's a very smart computer we put in these things. Uh, it's not like you can even secure it in some cases. So I think the first thing we need to ask ourselves is do we really need this to be connected to something else? Um, we're now moving into a time uh, where we're talking about connected cars so that traffic can flow without traffic signals. Um, we're going to we're going to raise a generation of children that never learn how to drive that with self-driving cars. We'll just get in and say, uh, yeah, take me to your leader, um, wherever they're going, right? So, um, but, but really interconnected cars is one of the great promises because it will fix traffic, especially in, really, in big places like LA, where traffic's a problem. So that's one of the promises of the internet of things. The other thing is it makes it all us more connected. Um, we, uh, I always tell my students about the days before we had the internet, which was when I went to college, and the day before cell phones, and I'm like, how did we ever get in contact with each other? Um, but, you know, and, and you can build your own internet of things now. I mean, um, you, Raspberry Pi and Arduino is, you know, I, we, I do a Raspberry Pi group on 15th every month at RCBI. I and mean, the things that people are bringing in are just awesome, you know. Everything from controlling your Christmas lights to, um, you know, building computers that, 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 that children can use to, to learn how to code. Um, but I guess that's, my song and dance, my introduction. 
Yeah, and one of the cool things about that Raspberry Pi group, I would say, is like 90% uh, of the projects, we kind of have a joke that, why did you do that? And said, just because I can, you know. But then occasionally there really will be a project where somebody wants to control the flow of water through a pipe or something to that effect, and we're all kind of like, oh, there really is a use for this stuff. So well, you were talking about the ag innovation thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just yesterday, um, RCBI has an agricultural innovations group uh, where we we combine agriculture and technology. And uh, we had a, a contest for middle school and high school students to come in and show solutions to problems. And uh, great stuff just coming out of these kids who, who kind of don't know what they don't know in a lot of ways or haven't figured out that sometimes it's hard to get stuff done. Uh, putting uh, GPS trackers in the broadhead so that whenever you shoot your deer, you can go find it and get Probably your progress back. Only in West Virginia, yeah, well, it, yeah, Clay County, right? <laughs> Um, had other kids that were uh, controlling the the water flow into uh, troughs for sheep, uh, which again, you know, I mean, all, all that's it's great. You would be able to monitor that from a distance. Uh, other kids want to use drones to, to to plant seeds, water stuff, and and all of that's actually happening in a lot of uh, ways already. So so yeah, fun stuff going on with uh, agricultural innovations. Um, and the Raspberry Pi group, which is open to everybody. That's a totally free thing. It's part, we, we say that it's a part of our, our makerspace, which is one of the areas we're really proud of at RCBI. We've got uh, 3D printers, uh, some uh, tabletop lathes, or tabletop router with uh, a laser connected to it as well, in, uh, form molds, things like that, that you can come in, pay 40 bucks a month, Play with that stuff all you want. Tinker, have fun with it. Um, use build all, your use all the filament. And the yeah, use all the filament and the 3D printers. And we've got a lot of the folks from our Raspberry Pi group and others are in there using, you know, printing cases for their Raspberry Pis. Uh, we got a guy who's building a robotic uh, spider and he's printing out the parts for that. And it's actually going to be an agricultural spider as well. That's awesome. Yeah. There you go. Sounds like fun stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we, we deal with IoT more on an enterprise level uh, and a citizen level uh, for government services. Um, you know, we have tens of thousands of assets on our network at any given time from fire systems to camera systems to body camera systems to voting machines. Uh, we have, there's a voting machine here, um, not a current one, but those are IoT equipment. We have other embedded systems like digital signs everywhere. One of the more interesting things, we talk about vehicle um, uh, automation. The Department of Transportation, I'm good friends with this uh, CTO, Chief Technology Officer, within a specific state, uh, and they're starting to incorporate what they consider more than a mesh network, but really not a cloud infrastructure, but they're apparently calling it a fog uh, infrastructure, so you can uh, use, use that buzzword. Um, it's, it's apparently a Cisco-specific term. Um, go figure, and um, they're working on that to start tracking uh, cars on highways for automation and doing a lot of the physics and all the things that can be done, not only from a vehicle automation, but more of an efficiency for a transportation perspective. Um, you know, you know, Tesla just came out with the, I think that semi, uh, they had a concept for a while. Uh, things like that. Now the Department of Transportation and the governments are going to have to be able to track those, especially when you have automated semis going through for transportation and weighing and a lot of things that are regulatory mandated, uh, but that will still need to happen even if they're happening in an automated fashion. Uh, so it's pretty interesting from a government perspective. Uh, we also have like medical equipment um, that's everywhere um, from doing DNA testing to forensics to um, to all kinds of stuff uh, for HHS and Health and Human Services. We have a pretty broad range of IoT, but a lot of governments don't even know that they might have these type of things, especially smaller governments that might have a regional medical examiner's office and not realize what their telescopes are or their microscopes are specifically on a network connected uh, if they know it or not to get firmware updates. 
and things like that. So it's pretty interesting to understand that. We started uh, an initiative probably about a year ago to start scanning uh, and really fingerprinting and, and inventorying all of our IoT that we previously didn't have in an asset inventory system before, other than maybe in the physical inventory system that the partner agency. Talking to Mark. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Internet of Things devices, we're talking about voting machines. We have a voting machine here that was also, we have one, because I bought it off eBay, um, that was in the DEF CON uh, voting machine hacker, hacker village. So today, I've given permission to actually pull the motherboard out of it, and we're going to try to dump the firmware, but we've already found these interesting ports. So, you know, how many people have devices in their house or on their network and they don't fully understand exactly what they are? Um, or, if you have physical access, what can you do with them? That's, that's pretty scary stuff. Does anyone watch Mr. Robot in here? So, you remember, it was last season where they basically screwed the woman's uh, home automation system until they drove her insane and she left the house so they could take it over to their headquarters. Sorry, spoiler alert, alert sorry. Um, can't believe they killed Rick, too. Um, sorry. <clears throat> um, and it's really interesting, if you use something like Shodan, you can go out and see for yourself all the stuff that's hooked to the internet that shouldn't be, and you can find home automation out there. So. Theoretically, if you uh, if you wanted to, not that you would, because that would be a violation of law to unauthorized, unauthorized access to somebody's home automation system. But you could, you know, turn the lights down, turn the heat up, start playing uh, ACDC at 120 decibels easily, and um, they'll be like, "What's going on?" To them, it's magic. But in the wrong hands, if, um, if you're a nefarious person, you can do nefarious things. So the question is, is when are we going to have death by the Internet of Things, if we haven't already? And when will this become weaponized? If another nation state wanted to, um, say, attack a specific target, could they do that through the Internet of Things? Yeah, so it's definitely an interesting concept. A lot of entities are asking those questions. Uh, I do know that I've, I've seen some case studies uh, or scenario-based tabletops, right. potentially, um, that might have been tested, um, where a lot of uh, large entities have access control systems, obviously, from a fiscal perspective, uh, that may fail close or fail open, or if targeted, could fail, close, or open. Um, those buildings might also have a fire system that's also connected that can be then turned off. Um, and then if you think about that chain of attacks from going from a physical attack perspective into a hybrid uh, with IoT compromise, you could essentially have someone do something in a way where then it set, shut, shuts off all notification systems and locks everyone in. So if you think about the damage that could be done, um, and then if you do that systematically um, across a wide range of buildings or facilities all at once um, with other types of you know, situations and other types of deflection techniques and stuff like that that could happen at the same time, you could have a pretty catastrophic event. Um, and the scenarios are out there, or the tabletops are out there, but you know, the solutions aren't really out there. Yet. Aren't really out there. Right. So that brings a whole other discussion when you talk about you know, death of IoT, um, especially when you have these SCADA systems that were historically air-gapped or perceived to be air-gapped or were more so air-gapped because they just didn't have the connections that you could easily um, tie into um, are now being just hooked into this IoT infrastructure to easily manage them. And for the, like Stuxnet and stuff like that, um, where you, this will be more and more, um, more and more connected of maybe things that really, maybe they are full industrial control systems, but it's still an IoT thing. Yeah, and uh, the, kind of the history of RCBI, we we were traditionally in traditional manufacturing, right? I mean, it's it's you know, bills, lays, things like that. 
and we see that we need to move into the, the Internet of Things because uh, more and more that's, you know, if you're going to work in the industry or expand the industry, that's where the expansion is. And uh, so we, we've got people who are kind of driving the ship there saying, yeah, we need to work on car-to-car -car communication. We need to work on And there's no thought at that level that anything negative could go on, go on with that, right? It's all about, hey, yeah, let's just get an app. And so, yeah, we need to we need help from folks like you to make sure that we do it the right way and get things done properly. This goes back to a conversation I had at Jurassic Park uh, user group. We have, I forget his name. I hope he's not watching this presentation. Uh, yeah, David. I was talking to David, and like he wanted to roll out like small manufacturing is to replace the SCADA systems with inexpensive Raspberry Pis, which might work, but it's not, you don't think of that as being something that's enterprise grade, for example. So it'd be interesting, it's an interesting concept. I told him we probably could write a grant and actually do that, but you know, maybe we should think about it. But there's a lot of things you can do with the Internet of Things, but the question is, should you? Do I really know, need to know how many strokes my toothbrush did in the last week? Do um, I really need cameras in my house to watch my pets when people could be watching me? We, we have manufacturers putting um, television sets with cameras and microphones into the stream of commerce. Um, so. There's a lot of things that need to be done. The question is, who's going to do it? And the FTC has actually moved toward trying to regulate this a little bit. They've come out with some uh, guidances about Internet of Things devices. If you're going to sell this, you know, you need to make sure that you're disclosing uh, properly uh, any any privacy or security concerns. But still, people are buying things and just putting it in their house. You know, baby monitors is another one. Um, and, you know, I don't want to give the scary internet speech to everybody, but there's, it's like when you get a pet, right? Pets are great, pet them, but you gotta take them for walks and clean their litter box. Um, and the internet of things is sort of like that sort of same trade-off, is that, you know, you got this wonderful thing, but you need to understand the risk of this thing. So, one of the things I've been thinking about is, your home insurance, they'll actually give you um, a break if you have an alarm or camera system. Um, when are they going to start actually insuring the camera system and the alarms as well because they're affixed to your property? Do they become compromised or used to attack your house? That's, uh, that's an interesting thing, I'm sure. The best insurance companies don't even want to get into that. but. Um, but it's it's an it's an interesting time. This is uh, well, what West in many ways. Um, so you should probably explain what RCBI is, because everyone you know RCBI who's RCB and what is I? Yeah, Robert Seabird Institute RCBI. So yeah, we um, we work with lots of different uh, types of manufacturers and entrepreneurs. Uh, one of the, the, the areas that we're really expanding in right now is uh, developing entrepreneurship on lots of different levels. If, if you're inside West Virginia, we probably have a grant that could help you uh, develop a prototype, get a, a, a concept up and running. Um, we work with everything from horse speed buckets to uh, apps that tell you what time is best to plant spinach if you want to eat it on a certain date. Uh, and really just about everything in between. Um, so, so yeah, so RCBI is happy to, to, to work with entrepreneurs, happy to work with anybody who deals with any kind of manufacturing. We have 3D printers that uh, have print beds that are 36 inches by 36 inches by 18 inches. Uh, we print in metal, we print in uh, powder, so lots of different uh, different printers that are available to anybody. All you gotta do is send your file to us, we'll tell you how much it costs to print, we'll print it for you. Uh, laser cutters, mills, lathes, um, apprenticeship programs really don't apply to folks in here probably very much. Um, you never know. You never know, that's true. 
Okay, okay. Sure, we have apprenticeship programs, $4.9 million grant from the Department of Labor to create a thousand apprentices, which is pretty cool. Uh, and, uh, and then we do the West Virginia Makes Festival every year in October, first Friday in October, which I don't know how else you want to celebrate your manufacturing day, but you know. Um, and uh, the made, uh, West Virginia Makes Festival has cash prizes for people who can show off what they make, and a lot of times that is a software-based thing, but uh, that's or a, hardware or hardware, or oh, internet lots of hardware, or internet, internet, internet of things, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So with that, um, what are you requiring, or guide, what kind of guidelines do you set when people are doing these IoT things or funding, and then what type are you guys suggesting, at least to our partnerships with other security companies or advisory companies that look at that stuff? I know a lot of places do, some don't, a lot don't. Are you guys looking at that stuff to maybe be able to get like a maybe local community, of, let's say security forms or something to start maybe helping out and assisting these people workshops or to yeah. make sure that whatever, you know, eventually at some point, you know, the FTC has certain guidelines, but eventually those guidelines might come into regulations that might be halt, you know, innovation because of this, you know, strict guidelines of manufacturing at some point in time to make sure that everything's kosher at that level if it comes or when it comes, right? Yeah, yeah, I would have to say we, we've been uh, embarrassingly lax in that maybe a little. Uh, we do, we, one of the great projects that has come through um, and went through our early stage funding and we have what's called the 1050 Business Accelerator. Uh, we've got a gentleman that uh, used to work with the Navy and he's developed a warning system for bus stops. So if you're coming around a blind turn, there would be lights on either side, and as the bus would approach, it would receive a signal from the bus and turn the light on, a flashing light, and let you know that there's a bus stop happening. So as far as like what regulations and things like that, we've gone through like the Department of Transportation. Sure, that could be used to, to signal all kinds of stuff, right? And no, so we're, we're embarrassingly lax, I would say. So no, we need to, to step that up. I'm not sure if you know we talked about regulations or anything. Yeah, yeah. Things, I think it's just a matter of time. It's going to take something really bad to happen, but you know, the same way we regulate credit card transactions and uh, student records and medical records, you know, there are regulations to that, federal regulations, and I think that eventually it will happen. The question is, is that. I think we need to be ready to assist policymakers on what is good and how you don't stifle innovation by making overreaching regulations. But yeah, and to expand on that, I was at a pretty good, a really good talk at ShmooCon DC uh, this past year where the FTC was there and they were okay. looking for people to join their work group uh, when they were yeah, almost before the regulations <laughs> because they the not regulation, but guidelines, I guess, um, guidance is out, where almost it's like, they call it the equivalent nutrition label of IoT, of, well, it, you know, is this system going to be patched or not patched, is it, is it, is it, is it, is it patchable in the first place, is there a lifespan of this device, is there an end of life date, um, you know, what, what security and privacy concerns are on there, and they started talking about that stuff, and there were a lot of people and researchers that were uh, engaging on that. They have, I believe they have almost a GitHub repository of just um, policy stuff and uh, questions, and there's a whole kind of like trusted group you could kind of get a part of uh, through uh, some of the people that were kind of heading that. And uh, they even said at first when they were heading it, it was outside of their official position of the FTC, um, but that they were getting that that was coming down the line, but they couldn't officially say at that time. But now that stuff does exist. There are people on those work groups. I know uh, a few people uh, in some major companies like um, Rapid Seven and a lot of vulnerability companies that are looking at this IoT thing from a vulnerability perspective and scanning perspective and enterprise and getting tied into these work groups that uh, maybe are heard or not heard, but it's kind of like, okay, if there's 10 good people in a group like that, maybe only one might be heard. So, or, and then that one person that might get heard, only maybe 10% of their stuff might actually end up in a policy or regulation from a government level because all the drafts it goes to, right? Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. um, and, and 
everyone always says, well, we never had any input, but you know, NIST standards and all that kind of stuff, yeah. and those special publications, they all go for, out for public draft for, yeah, for years. Yeah. But you know, no one looks at them. no one looks at them. No one knows where they are. You click through; it redirects like ten different times. Um, you know, the documents direct to each other, right? I mean, and then submitting. You know, you have to submit some kind of Excel draft of what line that you want to um, a, a comment on, and then you have to, you know, who knows where you send that to? Yeah. That might not even be a government address. It might be some random. Research Gmail, it, literally at Gmail. Like I've been through all of that stuff to try to, you know, especially at the local government level, we meet um, and we try to put insights to these federal standards, even this standards, just so they have uh, the realistic functionality for a local government level other than the state and federal level, just because things are different. For cities, can never be compliant or or have these standards at a level because. It's just too much for them, and there might be only two percent of the information they need to they need to have, so it needs to be called out, or they're just not going to do anything anyway, right? So, um, it, uh, as many people as possible need to be involved in those things, or we're going to be left behind. Just like I know, Bill, you have always you always do the talk about regulating just the security professional industry and licensing and things in general. If we're not involved, we're going to get left behind. And they're going to make something, right? And I'm surprised that NIST hasn't delved into the Internet of Things. I don't know that I have so many documents. But I, no, I do some of these working groups. I do a lot of working groups related to education and uh, the NICE framework and curricula trying to fill the skills gap. And we go down that rat hole, but we won't. But it's interesting how in, innovation drives regulation, which then drives market. Is that the way that we should probably look at this? Because right now what we have is innovation drives the market and no one's looking at the consequences of the innovation. We still don't really teach kids how to code securely. And um, it's part of the problem. It means that you know information security will be a growing field because we're not doing it right in the first place. And I think the question, I guess the FTC can control um, what's going into the stream of commerce, and that's the, reason, that's the way they're looking at it. But everyone, especially those NIST documents, you really should look at them. They're boring if you want a, a good sleeping pill. Um, and and uh, you know, Josh Brunty is on the NIST working group for digital forensics. So. Um, and you know they they're all over the place uh, with uh, with some really great work, but they don't really. That's the reason you know that's the reason they have a big campus in D.C. It's like you know, NIST is like going into college university. You know, um, it's it's pretty big. FTC's uh, the FDA is the same way, but you know as much as we rail against regulations, if we don't regulate it. What's the consequences? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, we probably shouldn't wind it up. We went 30 minutes, which is fine. Do you all have anything else to say? Yeah, I mean, any, any audience uh, discussion on IoT? I mean, any, any suggestions or anything out there? Got a so, question in the back. So it seems like a lot of the IoT that I see should, should really be an intranet of things. I mean, like, it, it might be useful for me to know that um, um, something happened with my oven and it's set for 375, but for some reason it, it won't get above 360. You know, that, that might be nice for me to have an alert on my phone, but only while I'm sitting at the house. It doesn't need to go to you know, the manufacturer's server and then back to my phone. It should go straight from my internet to my phone. So the, just to restate that for the um, um, for gentleman the, in the back. For the internet. For the internet uh, <laughs> things. Uh, the gentleman in the back said that, uh, you, know, you, you know, we don't really, he doesn't really see why 
internet of things really needs to be an internet thing, but more of an intranet, like a local repository, or not really a repository, but you know, a local connection of, for instance, example, uh, an oven going to a certain degree, and then knowing that internally, but only at home. Um, and then I, I guess I would kind of, yeah, it's kind of general, I'll summarize that, uh, and I would kind of expand on that. Um, should we look at uh, manufacturers to offer their SaaS services that all this stuff reports to uh, an on-premise solution for now the consumer market. Um, and I, I want to also just bring up one other thing that I know I, I listened to, kind of a shout out to Risky Business podcast. Um, they had a really good, I think a vendor on that was pretty interesting, uh, and I don't really remember the name of the vendor per se, but their 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 entire business model was taking cloud and SaaS applications for large enterprises, partnering with those SaaS enterprises to literally translate, copy, and completely clone their code to an on-premise solution for large, especially DOD or highly regulated environments that do need that capabilities of those SaaS applications, but need them on-premise. Um, and there are companies from an enterprise perspective now that are coming out that Literally, it's their goal to almost take the cloud and push it back in from a from an intranet perspective, or at least an MPLS or large type of um, you know uh, secure network perspective uh, locally. Then having it all out there publicly available, uh, and I think that's a that's a thing where we need people on the working groups be able to kind of maybe some manufacturers can have that option um, or give that option. If I, can't, I mean, that's kind of discussion, right? Yeah, I, I mean, you've got a device, you've got an app, and, you know, the device talks to the app, but there's, you know, a server part there that the only thing I can think of is it's for the company marketing to get information from it. Yeah, I was at um, uh, the manufacturer's uh, show in Cleveland, and one of the things that they were doing was putting microphones inside of... Uh, um, mills and lathes, so that they could listen to the machine and figure out when it was going to break down. So, if you're only having the data from your own machine, it's going to be less likely to to be helpful for that manufacturer to know when somebody else's machine is going to break down. So, if your oven is having that problem and ovens all across the country are having it, it might be good for the manufacturer to be able to get that information. Well, I, I mean, at that point, right? I can hit the diagnostic button on the app on my phone. I don't need to send all of my information. You know, I don't need to have my oven open to the internet all the time. Yeah, I mean, you probably should. I mean, it's probably not the best thing. Uh, but, you know, when you bring this thing home and you configure it in your house, do you really think about what you're doing? It's convenience. And, and there are some companies out there, like Vera Home, for example, that have a controller. I'm thinking, well, we have controllers, but that thing is talking to a cloud server in order to give you, to authenticate you, in order to send you alerts. So it's still, like you say, talking to the vendor's uh, infrastructure. Um, so I think what we have here is a business opportunity, so uh, we should talk with Jamie later and build one of those. Yes. Uh, the biggest thing you're missing in this, as the vendor wants your product to talk back to them, which has already been proven because I think Intel has killed one of the markets next year, is they want your device to talk back because they can plan obsolescence you in. Well, we don't want we want you to buy the new one, so we're killing Yeah, it's a planned stuff. obsolescence, and there's a lot of people who, who, who uh, allege that. Uh, no, it's been proven. Oh, it's there's, been proven? There's okay. two products, home monitoring products, that have been discontinued because right. they shut down the server, the device will no longer work in your house. Oh, okay, well, that's nice. Um, you know, there are people who claim that the iPhone gets slower the older it gets. It's not because of hardware or software, it's just that somehow Apple's slowing it down. Um, but you know, a lot of people a lot of people say a lot of things. So in Huntington we have um, internet connected parking meters now. And uh, so, I, so I know parking meters and parking meter hacking has been around for a long time, but it's kind of interesting to me. I have no idea how it works. It's fascinating to me that it does work at all. Um, 
But if that's, you know, that's an example of something that's as pedestrian as parking your car has now moved into a, a network to enable the app. You know, what's next? That's, that's the question. Yeah, when, when you bring up those parking meters and things, a lot of larger cities that take on something they call a smart sh smart city initiatives. Yeah. Um, where they're pretty, it's pretty much in and out of things for citizen services, if it's from lights to mark parking meters to um, uh, potentially solar panel charging stations to um, kiosks for citizen services. There's a a city. I, I assume, I'm pretty sure it's in California, uh, probably one of the Silicon Valley cities or one of the more prominent cities over there, maybe it was Seattle, um, but they've actually, they were one of the first cities to tie into the Alexa API for Amazon to answer citizen-centric ser uh, services and questions, like where do I, what, like they can literally go to these kiosks and ask it um, a question just like you would an Alexa or Google Voice or you know anything like that. Uh, Google Home, um, and uh, they would, would answer. Um, and, it, and it's really just basic business intelligence um, decision systems that have always been around that are more canned questions more than actually using the entire probably um, Alexa, semi AI, or whatever you want to talk about. But um, that stuff is happening. But then when you're asking those, those things, your questions, it's storing again that data um, and talking back somewhere. So if you ask it, where do you want to get food stamps at or something? It's taking that information, storing it, and then it might know who you are and then ask you like, oh, well, I see that you have these parking violations. You should probably go pay your tickets yeah. too. Yeah. And then it might be like, oh, wait, you haven't paid these tickets. You have a, you have a bench warrant out. Oh, and then all of a sudden the things start flashing and then you're, someone's, you know, knocking, on someone's the knocking right there. You're not even at the door. You're on the corner talking to a key. Oh, okay, machine, okay, okay. Right? So, I mean, those things, um, you know, how they connected, which is maybe a lot of benefit services because it's connecting a lot of citizen services that you might not be aware of. Or maybe you're like, oh, did you know that because your parking fine is this amount now, you can actually do a payment service. You don't actually have to pay in full. A lot of people might not know that. It's embedded because a lot of cities don't want you to know that or they're not going to get the money, right? But maybe at some point in time, that's all connected. They, the cities will also not be able to like hide their processes like that. Not that they hide them, but... Um, things like that are all being talked about uh, and connected. Uh, and it's pretty interesting um, because eventually we'll all be there, and then it's pretty scary. Yeah, right. Exactly. When we talk about Big Brother. I mean, that's I can't think of anything that's more Big Brotherish. You know, government, government everywhere. Has Ron Paul heard about this? Or yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, that's, that's definitely an anti-libertarian streak in hackers is not going to like that at all. Does anyone have, else have any questions? Do, do you have anything else to say? Thanks, thanks for coming out to our panel discussion. Um, I hope that we were insightful. Um, if you have any questions afterwards, you can come up to us and uh, I'm sure we'd be happy to answer any questions. Especially if you're local and you're interested in the makerspace at RCBI or coming to our uh, Raspberry Pi meetups. RCBI also has uh, facilities in South Charleston and Bridgeport. South Charleston, Bridgeport, and soon Williamson. Williamson, that's great. Um, but that's awesome. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Do you want else to have any, any closing remarks? Okay, great. I was going to drop it, but then I'll owe somebody money, so. <laughs>